think some of these lectures have a, a little bit of um, repetition, but the repetition is good because in the beginning, you know, it's hard. To, it, it's getting the points repeated from a different perspective um, adds to the clarity. Uh, I'm giving two two lectures back to back. I'm going to start. I flipped the order just because this one I think is a little bit more straightforward. I think there's a lot of overlap with what John was saying, so I'll try to focus on the things that are not overlapped. Um, the anti-grade femur, this is basically a talk on anti-grade femur technique. This is a publication we did in Surgical Techniques of JBJS, which really goes through a lot of this uh, material and you may find to be a helpful resource. Uh, this is really what John was talking about, the, uh, the nail <coughs> having a male end and a female end and um, it, plays into, it plays into choosing your, your nail length and making sure that you have thick part of the nail in the moving segment. Um, I prefer uh, using, I agree, the piriformis is an easier technique. Uh, well, it's a little harder in terms of the entry, but getting the nail in is easier and then it's straight and it's, it's, you can rotate around the nail nicely. Uh, and I, I use 18 as a cutoff point just because it gives me a little extra buffer uh, with, the, with the idea of skeletal maturity. Um, so here's an example. You know, here's a patient who has a leg length discrepancy of 30 millimeters. And so you know, we're going to do a lengthening. And so this is, this is the, um, the idea of the planning that John was talking about. I'm going to add a little twist to it is that John was basically saying, okay, you start with a particular nail length, you choose your nail length, and then you figure out your osteotomy. It's really all playing with the same numbers, but I'm gonna show it to you a little bit differently because this is the way I tend to think about it, is I tend to think about um, picking my osteotomy level first and then choosing the shortest nail length that I can use. So. It's, it's really the same numbers, but a little bit flipped around in the sense that for an anti-grade, the typical thing is you look at that lateral x-ray and you figure out, okay, what's the apex of the deformity? Because that's where I really want to do my osteotomy. I tend to be a long nailer, so I try to use a long nail. But <clears throat> so I, ha I look at it as SNL, the shortest nail length, equals the osteotomy, which you pick out based on this picture plus the amount of lengthening, plus the 50 and the 30. The 50, the 30 is the, the male length at the beginning, the, the short, the thin part that's sticking out, and then the 50 is that extra um, sort of buffer that you want at least 50 millimeters, 40 to 50 millimeters of thick nail in the moving segment at the end of the lengthening. And so in this case, so this is my typical planning, SNL equals the osteotomy 170 plus 27 plus 50 plus 30, 277, and then based on that, I say, okay, I'm going to put in a 305. You can always put in a longer nail, not a shorter nail. And then I picked out a 107 or an 8.5. I also made a little note to myself that I wanted to correct some rotational deformity at the same time as the surgery. I position patients um, uh, with a bump under the buttock on a radial loosened table. Um, step one is to um, is to make the osteotomy level at the plot at the spot that you decided. So percutaneous approach, multiple drill holes. This is what it looks like on X-ray. With a, I usually use a 4.8 millimeter drill. You can use the four or five millimeter drill that's directly from the precise set. They have nice sharp drills. Um, I tend to uh, keep the leg in an adducted position while I do the um, drill holes because you're doing most of the case in that adducted position. The guide wire is then inserted into the proximal femur, whether it's the troch or the piriformis. Uh, this is what it looks like. You have, if you have a bump under the buttock um, and the patient is tilted about 15 degrees, then when you come to a lateral or an x-ray just a little bit off the lateral, you get a very, very nice view of the proximal femur. So you don't need to use a, a, a fracture table for these kind of cases. And then you start your reaming. So, the, the th you can think of the drill holes as serving two purposes. Number one, it's the first step of the osteotomy. And number two, it's the vent hole, right? Because you are reaming an intact bone, which can have the complication of a, of a fat embolism syndrome. So the idea, you know, as a concept, 
we usually try to vent. And so I would say that these serve as vent holes and then the, you know, the reamings exude through those holes. I've been fortunate I ha using this technique and not putting any other vent holes. I, haven't had, I have not had a case of fat embolism uh, in, in a good number of cases at this point. Um, so I do my, so this is my entry point. I, um, I typically use a, an ACL reamer, like an acorn reamer. It's very, very small. You don't even have to use a soft tissue protector. And then you start reaming. I do ream about two millimeters longer than the nail, uh, uh, wider than the nail. And so this is what it looks like. This is the, uh, the, uh, the drill holes. You can see the entry point, uh, very small incisions. There's the guide wire, there's the drilling, that's the incision. Um, at the end of the reaming, I tend to put in my rotational markers. I put in uh, a Steinman pin, usually 2.8 or 3.2 millimeter Steinman pins. The proximal one is posterior to the nail at the level of the lesser trochanter. The distal one is usually distal. If you're just trying to prevent rotational deformity, I put them in parallel to each other. If I'm trying to correct rotational deformity, I put them in with the amount of axial uh, rotational difference that I want to correct. Then the guide wire is removed. It's a, it's a solid nail, so you, know, you, you can't put the nail in over the guide wire. And then you put the nail up to the osteotomy site, and then you complete the osteotomy, and then you pass the nail. So it looks something like this. You've got your nail up to the site, the osteotomy is completed, and you push your osteotomy, you push your nail across the osteotomy. You know, the key thing is getting the thin part of the nail across the osteotomy. Once you do that, you got it. You know, then it's not gonna escape on you. Um, usually what ends up happening is immediately, as soon as the osteotomy is complete, the femur does this. So usually just having your assistant lift the leg into extension allows the, uh, the nail to pass pretty easily. But it's worth taking a couple of fluoroscopy shots just to make sure that you can get it across and that you're not traumatizing the, uh, the mechanism. If there's a little bit of varus, you know, you can also just do a little manual. But I tend not to use an external fixator during for routine anti-grade lengthenings. Um, some people do, some people don't. I, I haven't found it to be necessary for the routine um, anti-grade lengthenings. The, the other question always is, you know, how much do you Com complete your osteotomy. You want to do it just the right amount. You don't want to displace your osteotomy so much that you have trouble passing your nail. On the other hand, you don't want to do an incomplete osteotomy, right? It's the same story as what we've always been thinking about. So you start to develop a feel for it. I try to do the osteotomy, minimize the displacement, because as soon as I pass the nail, since I have my rotational markers, I tend to rotate around the nail. And so that, to me, gives me that feeling that I have completed my osteotomy. And I like that feeling. It actually works even best, best with a piriformis nail, because then it's truly straight. You get a very nice feeling of that rotation. You know, the same feeling that we get when we take the two rings of the Ilizaro frame and, and you go like this. So it's the same, same kind of thing for me. And then um, locking screws are inserted. You can do it in whatever order you like. I prefer to do the distal ones first because I try to make my rotation perfect, but then it allows me that if I need to do a little residual uh, rotational correction, I can do it uh, uh, after I get my distal ones in, and then I can just put the proximal ones in easily with the jig. Um, these are they're bolts rather than screws, which is just a little technical thing that takes getting used to. But the reality is, is that the bolts are much stronger because the, co the diameter, the core diameter of the screw is bigger. So for example, if you put in a five millimeter bolt compared to a four three, uh, a five millimeter screw, the core diameter is four three versus five oh. And we know that the strength of a screw is related to the core diameter and it's exponential. So it's actually a big advantage. I've never seen, in my experience so far, I've never seen a broken um, bolt. Have you? Yeah, I've not, I've not seen a broken screw yet. I've seen, I had a few broken nails, but I've never seen a broken bolt. Um, this is, so these screws go in first, the screws, screws, screws go in second, and you can see my markers, this is the rotational marker distal to the nail, and this is the rotational marker that's proximal to the nail, posterior, so it doesn't get in the way of the path of the nail. Here you see an example in the axial plane 
of the two markers. In this case, there was probably some rotational deformity that I dialed in. I use a goniometer intraoperatively to make sure it's exactly in the position that I want. Uh, this is what the nail looks like going in. That's, uh, so the nail is at the osteotomy. The osteotomy is being completed. And, uh, and then at the end of this process, you do, an, you do a trial distraction in the operating room, which you can see going on over here. You identify the magnet, you make a mark on the skin, and then you can draw the footprint of the ERC, the external remote control device, and you can do one millimeter of, of distraction to confirm that the nail is working. What you're looking at when you do your distraction is this, this is the nail, these are the gears, and then there's a little space in here just below this top hat. And this is where you actually start to see the space of the nail on the x-ray. A couple of examples, 16-year-old um, with 45 millimeters of LLD from a congenital case. This is the, you can see after the lengthening, Again, this is the space that you end up measuring uh, when you're following the distraction after surgery. And this is what we meant about, you know, that the thick part of the nail, you want th enough thick part of the nail in the distal segment at the end of the lengthening. I take my nails out routinely after about 9 to 12 months. Uh, as soon as we have good healing, most of the healing that I've been seeing with the anti-grade femurs is hypertrophic healing. I've not had any cases of refracture after taking out the nails. This is one of my early cases, a 25-year-old, so an adult patient with four and a half centimeters of LLD uh, on the left side. And um, this is three months post-op. I saw this kind of healing. I was, I was very impressed. Um, uh, you can see the troch nail puts, I, I do think that the troch nails put them into a little bit of varus, kind of remodels, and you don't really notice it. But if you look critically, most of the troch nails do kick it into a little bit of varus. Um, yep. Yep. And this was this patient uh, three months after surgery. It was- uh, Go ahead, extend your knee. It was uh, pretty astounding. And flex and it. knee range of motion does not tend to be nice. a problem with these cases. Um, this is an example of an adult patient who had an, a club foot and a one inch leg length discrepancy. I didn't want to mess with the mechanics of the, a finely balanced club foot. And so I will I'll we'll go to the femur and accept a little bit of knee height difference. Again, piriformis entry is my, is my preference, as John had mentioned. And so we did a lengthening in the proximal femur. This is a 40-year-old guy. And again, you can see this hypertrophic healing that you see. This is a, a uh, post-traumatic patient, also 50-year-old man. Uh, he's been through a lot, not a particularly healthy guy. Uh, leg length discrepancy 40 millimeters after this situation. Again, just to go over, you know, SNL type of analysis, the osteotomy is at 170, 40 is the length, the 50 and the 30 is a constant. So the SNL is 290. In other words, that's the shortest nail that I want to put in. I choose a 305. And so I can predict, since I'm going longer by 15, that instead of having 50 of the thick nail in the distal segment, then I'm going to end up with 665, which is even better, right? And so you, this is what it looks like at the end of the lengthening. And so I can predict exactly how much thick nail is going to be in the distal segment. And this is the healing that, you, that we, uh, we observed. Again, in, in, the, in the kids, they heal, they heal really quickly, 12-year-old uh, with congenital. You can see this hypertrophic healing and, and nail removal. So in summary, uh, some technical points, trochanteric uh, entry for 18 and younger, otherwise piriformis for antegrade. Um, again, just a reiteration of what John said, we generally reaming two millimeters over the length of the nail because we're using flexible reamers. Um, I like to rotate around the nail to complete or confirm the osteotomy. Um, so that's why I always routinely put in these rotational markers. I like putting in the distal locking first and then dial in a little bit of rotation with the, and then put in the proximal if I need to. And then my recipe for distraction, uh, well, I will tell you, I'll be honest with you, I, I stopped doing the intraoperative distraction because um, I, just found, I just found that it wasn't, uh, at least for me, it wasn't helpful. So because of that, 
I save a little bit more time in the operating room. That's one thing. <laughs> but I want to get going a little bit more quickly. So this has been my recipe, which has been worked very well for me as I, I start distraction on day four in the femur. Uh, and I go 0.33 four times a day for the first four days. I call it the rule of fours. Four times a day for the, starting on day four for four days. And then I decrease it to three times a day as the typical amount of, of length. And then of course, this is really just a slide to remind me, to remind you that this is really the Ilazarov method, right? I mean, what we're doing here is we're doing, we're adhering to the principles of the Ilazarov method. We're just using a different, a different tool. So all of the things that we know as, as lengthening surgeons really, really, for the most part, apply in, in, this, in this practice as well. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it's going to be answered. I don't use, I use the, ex, the, the temporary external fixator in more complicated cases, more as you're going to see in this talk, which is acute deformity correction and then lengthening. So, you, you know, you can use it if you like. Um, and, you know, John can comment. I think John routinely uses the uh, X fix for antegrade. I mean, you know, the idea of doing the osteotomy, having your pins putting a, a bar on just to hold it is also, you know, I mean, it's, you have that option. I tend not to use it for the routine cases, but I use it for, as you'll see in this talk, when I'm doing deformity correction and then lengthening. Yes? you ever find indications of rigid reamers I've never used the rigid reamers. You know, I've only used flexible reamers. I think that uh, because part of the reason that we ream two millimeters over is because, you know, you're reaming, you have to have that little bit of extra room because you're not really reaming it straight. Uh, but I have never, I have no experience using rigid reamers. Yes. Yeah. I haven't. I haven't. I would be hesitant to do it on somebody with osteopenia, but I haven't had any fractures uh, in that situation. Okay. So um, acute deformity correction and lengthening. Um, so again, just to reiterate, the accuracy of lengthening we found was 96% when using this technique when we looked at our first cohort of lengthenings, which was an average of 35 millimeters, uh, measuring the actual distraction compared to what was prescribed. So you take a patient presents with this x-ray. So this is the knee x-ray that presents to the knee surgeon, right? Looks like I'm giving the wrong talk. and. Uh, you could just do a total knee, or if you listen to the patient's history, or you have, you know, you're looking for other things, you realize that there's more to the picture. And you can see this is a varus procurvatum uh, malunion that's associated with a leg length discrepancy of 25 millimeters, right? It's a whole different story. And these are not the kind of things you want to miss uh, and then just treat uh, the knee with an arthroplasty or a unicompartmental knee replacement, right, which is what it looks like. So, um, it, you know, here you can see the MAD is medial, representing the varus. You can see that the planning shows that the deformity is coming from the femur. You do your planning and you can see that the apex of the deformity is kind of where it is obvious, right? No surprises. Then I switch over to this anatomic axis planning because now I have to figure out where I'm going to cut the bone, where I can make it so that the canal is going to be con confluent between the proximal and the distal segment. I, I use my SNL analysis that we talked about to figure out the nail lengths by measuring each segment. And then intraoperatively, this is, a, I think, a good example of, of using an intraoperative external fixator. Here, this is, I, use, I like to use these 
two pin fixators, but because this was a biplanar deformity, I used a double fixator. This is a technique that uh, I learned when I was in Baltimore uh, 18 years ago. <laughs> um, and you can see, you can put your fixator pins to control both the coronal and the sagittal planes, but you see the pins are placed so that they're out of the path of the nail, right? So that's really one step of where the fixator is really, really helpful. And number two is, you know, you do your osteotomy, you can use your fixators to reasonably line up the canals, and then you can use, um, you know, the, the uh, intramedullary nailing sets have these fingers that, where you can pass a guide wire, so that's another uh, nice technical point. And then once you do that, once you get your guide wire and you get it reasonably straight, then you can start reaming, you pass your nail, and, um, and in this case, sometimes it's a little hard to predict how much length you're going to get from the deformity correction, but here you can see we got, a, we got about half from the deformity correction, but, and we got about half from the additional small lengthening. Uh, and despite, you know, when you do these big acute deformity corrections, you can get some slower bone healing. So maybe slow down your distraction a little bit, be a little sensitive to it, but you can see here it healed up nicely. Now, there's still some residual uh, deformity, and so just as a quick little, you know, sort of a, 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 an aside, um, I, at the same time that I did his um, um, removal of the nail, I also planned a proximal tibial osteotomy, right? You can see, and an opening wedge correction to really provide a complete, uh, comprehensive solution for this patient. Uh, again, the reverse rule of thumbs is something that we use a lot in terms of planning my blocking screws. I'll show you another example of a uh, tibial deformity. Uh, Ruvain, this is your, this is, Ruvain, this is the case I wanted you to see, right? This is the <laughs> femur and tibia. So you can see here, this is a, 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 a older teenager who has fibular hemimelia and some shortening that's roughly divided between the femur and the tibia, but you can see there's a valgus deformity in the, in the, uh, in the tibia, and so you can do your, you do your joint orientation angles, confirm these things, you do your planning, you can see you've got the, the femurs straight, I've got my SNL analysis for that, I've got my SNL analysis for the tibia, um, but I want to do that deformity correction, and again, you, you know my philosophy on this is the blocking screw is critical, you have to figure out what the, what the size of the blocking screw, where the blocking screw has to go relative to the size of the nail and the size of the canal. And you can see here a um, couple of other points, the fibular length stabilization screws, proximal and distal, and you can see after lengthening half in the tibia, half in the femur, with the correction of the deformity and the blocking screw, uh, correction of the, uh, of the alignment. Very nice healing in the femur, very nice healing in the tibia, and again, I call your attention to that blocking screw. Remember, in the tibia, there's a tendency to go into valgus too. So even if you leave the operating room roughly straight, like let's say you have 10 degrees of valgus, and you say, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to do a diaphyseal osteotomy, I'm going to correct most of it. You, you might, if you undercorrect it two, three degrees, when you do your lengthening, you're going you're gonna to go back into valgus. So I would encourage you to use the block and screw in those kind of situations. Retrograde femur, I think, is sort of the workhorse of, these, of this acute deformity correction. Here's an example of uh, a, another malunion, four centimeter LLD, varus recurvatum deformity. Um, again, reverse rule of thumbs. I do my coronal plane planning, and you can see there's 12 degrees of varus. Um, I need a blocking screw on the medial side, which is in the concavity of the deformity. Um, once I pick my, I do my anatomic planning, I, I template the nail in the direction to make sure that I'm, I'm right on, I go on top of my axis line. That's how I decide based on the size of the nail and the position where I'm going to put in my blocking screw. That's kind of the, the technique that goes along with that. Again, I have to make a decision about where to cut the bone so that I can cross the canals. Um, this is just a note. This would be the rule of thumbs, right? This is this is this is Ilizarov's rule of thumbs, and so the blocking screw in this case goes opposite. And you don't have to put in four blocking screws. I mean, you can decide what you want. In this case, the only blocking screw that I felt was 
uh, essential was the one that I've just pointed out to you. And so there was also some rotational malalignment in this case. So you can see I put in my external fixator pins with some rotational divergence out of the path of the nail. I do my osteotomy, correct the deformity, um, correct the rotation. This is, the this, is, this is a series of fluoro images of the lateral. So there's my entry point, there's my drill holes, there's my, the technique of translating the segments. I used the osteotome and flipped it so you can get a, a, an anterior translation of the segment. And, uh, and then you can see the reaming in the correct position. In the coronal plane, the starting point is, is critical and the direction of the reamer is critical. There are the drill holes. There's my, uh, um, there's my blocking screw. This was, a, um, this was a hand reamer because there was a, uh, the canal was a little bit obstructed, so that's another technique that can be useful. And this is what it looks like after the acute deformity correction passage of the nail. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the regenerate can be a little bit less good at when there's a big deformity correction. And you can see this is what it looked like. The regenerate is filling in. And, um, and filled in, just took a little bit longer. Uh, here, because I, um, I agree that the straight nails are better than the curved nails, and because it's riding along the posterior cortex, you don't need a posterior blocking screw. There's no room for it to go into a procurvatum or flexion deformity. And uh, you can see the patient happy and back to his active lifestyle. Um, this lady had uh, advanced arthritis of the knee and this varus uh, procurvatum deformity of the femur, big leg length discrepancy. And so um, again, the planning for the two planes, my blocking screw, uh, reaming um, in the correct direction in the distal segment, um, osteotomy to correct the deformity, correction, passage of the nail, um, we did the maximum lengthening. At this time, this was a six centimeter lengthening, so this was the maximum. But we cor corrected the extra articular deformity, and, uh, but she was still plagued by her advanced arthritis of the knee. And so when we went back to take out the nail, at uh, about nine months later, I did a knee replacement at the same time. So you can, you can sort of use different techniques to achieve your goal. So you start with this and you end with this. Um, you can do, uh, Christoph showed a case of bifocal where you're doing deformity correction on one end of the bone and lengthening on the other. This is the flip, the opposite of that. This is a patient who has a malunion of the proximal femur. You, know, you can see the neck shaft angle is decreased uh, from, this, uh, from this traumatic injury. And so my plan here was to do a blade plate proximally. And uh, so I did my blade plate planning proximal. And you can see uh, this is the steps of that surgery to correct the varus deformity. But I'm not going to correct the full leg length discrepancy by doing that. So at the same time, I did a, a retrograde femur lengthening. The blocking screw here was really just to prevent varus during the lengthening. And so this is an example of this bifocal approach where you're doing acute deformity correction on one end of the bone and you're doing lengthening uh, distally. And you can take care of, you can you know, you can correct the, the entire deformity. So in summary, <clears throat> acute correction and lengthening, uh, we use a lot of fixator-assisted uh, principles. Um, the entry point is very important when you're dealing with a short segment, whether it's the proximal tibia or the distal femur. The direction of the nail in the short segment, very important. Put your X-fix pins out of the path of the nail. Um, you can use the pins to mark rotation as well to prevent rotation or if there is rotational deformity. And in general, um, in general with, a, with, uh, with a severe deformity, do the osteotomy first, straighten the bone, hold it with the fixator, and ream in the straightened position. And blocking screw placement, you know, you're going to see different, in my, you're going to see different practices and different styles, but um, you know, in general, I prefer to put the blocking screws before the osteotomy is complete and before I'm reaming. That's my uh, preference if I'm doing a deformity correction. Uh, I use the reverse rule of thumbs to help figure out the placement of the blocking screws. 
And in general, the shortcut to that is that it's usually in the concavity of the deformity adjacent to the osteotomy. That's usually the placement for the blocking screws.